Live from Western Kentucky University, capital of the Hilltopper Nation. Whether it's in the locker room or on the field, behind the clipboard or on the court, home or away, we've got you covered. Get ready to enter the Red Zone, your destination for all things sports, right here on Revolution 91.7. Welcome, Hilltopper fans, to another Wednesday edition of the WKU Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. Your host tonight, Billy Rutledge, Jimmy Stratman, and Jeff Lightsey. Yeah, I'm here. Back again. As always, guys, we have another week of WKU sports to talk about. Yeah, we do. And a lot of stuff happened. A lot. Mm-hmm. The WKU football team, WKU baseball team, we're going to get into a little bit later. We have WBKO personality Chad Bishop joining us in the program at yes, 720. Sir. Oh, man. So we got a lot of questions for him. A lot to talk about. So, guys, let's start with the biggest and most popular sport on the hill here, the WKU football team. Winning, defeating Miami of Ohio in their second home game of the season, 56-14. to And, guys, it just looked too easy out there for the offense. I mean, everything was clicking. Yeah, Everything was. was clicking. All cylinders go on that game right there. The offense was good. The defense looked the best that it's been all season. Special teams was good. It was just, it was a wonderful game to watch. It was a great game, especially coming from a guy like me that likes points. I love yeah, seeing Jeff, a lot of points. It was boring. It, no, yeah. it wasn't boring. It was great football. We saw, you know, swag Brandon Dowdy on full display Saturday night. If you, you uh, know. Disclaimer to the uh, <laughs> the audience that doesn't know what we're talking about. Our Twitter account, okay. at WKU Red Zone, yes. tweeted out a uh, song lyric or a Cre- song. A yeah. song created a song, by a yep. student here on campus that goes by a rap named Tune. Tune Monster or something like that, something along those lines. He created a song called Swag, Brandon Dowdy. It is it's commemorating, you know, our all-time leading quarterback here on the hill, Brandon Dowdy. And so, up too. and so it's got a lot of really, I mean, it's catching wave. It's going, I mean, I wouldn't go as far to say viral, but it, it, it's catching a lot of wave, Listen, a lot of good have, stuff. If you hadn't heard it, go to our Twitter account, at WK Red Zone. You'll find it there, and you can hear how awful it is. No, it or, is a great song. Like it, it is a great song. We are in the process of incorporating it. To the WKU Red Zone, so it, it is a great song. But by, but back to the football game. Back to back, it. Back to the football game. Brandon Dowdy in his array of weapons on full display Saturday, and you know he lit it up once again, and he's continuing to prove why you know he's he's one of the best quarterbacks in the entire nation. This receiving core is one of the better receiving cores in the entire nation. I would go as far as to say I would go as far as to say that. I mean, when you have players like Taewon Taylor. You know, he's fourth in the entire country in receiving yards right now. Oh, and he had a great game. He did. He had. He was uh, Dowdy's favorite target. The dude's fast. Nine catches, 154 yards, and two touchdowns. His longest, 59 yards. That kid can run. And Dowdy said it in the press conference after the game. He doesn't think he can overthrow Taewon Taylor. No. He can put it too far in front of him, and Taewon will he's find a get, way to get there. He's going to get the ball. And it definitely helps when you get back Jared Dangerfield to full health. Fully I mean, healthy. The best comparison yeah. I have for Jared Dangerfield for your one Buccaneers reference of the night oh, is oh, Mike man. Evans. I mean, <laughs> the guys are so similar. And are they? Jared Dangerfield plays a pivotal role in the offense just like Mike Evans does. Yeah. And you talk <laughs> about the, like... the weapons that this team has. Nicholas Norris, who is just... Even though it's a crowded receiving it court, is he's still crowded. able to get yep. a lot of yards and catches. And then, not to forget, one of the best tight ends in the nation, Tyler Higby, who leads all tight ends in, receiving yards. in the nation yep. in catches and receiving yards with 26 oh. catches and 354 receiving yards. So, guys, I pose this question to you talking about the WKU football team and all their array of weapons is, who is the best target for Brandon Dowdy? Does he need a one sole target, a number one target to go to? But I'm trying to... Oh, I'm trying to get my words out. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's the best target well, for Brandon but Dowdy? It's hard to honestly choose one. It, it really is. The way Dowdy is so good at, at distributing the ball uh, uh, amongst everybody between Dangerfield, Antoine Grant, Taewon Taylor, you know, Tyler Higby, Nicholas Norris. I mean, between all those guys, it's hard to choose one. But if I had to say his favorite, at least right now, I think it's got to be Taylor. I mean, Taylor would uh, – Taylor. I, I think it's, it's mainly because – of what he's able to do, he, he, the way he's able to create points so fast. I mean, he, he's getting, he's averaging around 20 yards a catch. I mean, that's, I mean, 20 yards a catch is pretty impressive. You get 20 yards a catch, you're fourth in the whole entire country 
the entire country in receiving yards. It just yards. seemed like at the Indiana game, they would throw it to him, and he'd get it all the way down the field. And Western could have a two-play drive. And exactly. And score just between Dowdy and Taylor. Exactly. And so, but, but and he's, he's had four touchdowns in four games. I mean, Taylor, is, he's my pick. If, you're, if, if, I, if I have to choose one, I'm going with Taylor. Taylor's making his case. Yeah. And it, on, honestly, I agree with you that he's got so many different options in that receiving core that he can throw it to anybody and get the result he wants. But I have to go. With the big tight end, Tyler Hickey. Yeah, I mean, you can't go, go wrong with, with anybody. He had two yeah. touchdowns, too, in that game where, where he didn't have a whole lot of yards this game. Yeah. He wasn't the favorite target this game. But in, down in the red zone, he got his fair share of catches, and he made them count. And Definitely. earlier on in this season... Higby has been the go-to guy for Dowdy. He's been the one reliable guy that Dowdy can throw the ball to. He's been the most – I would go as far as to say he's probably been the most consistent from game one to game four because Higby was the only receiver to really show up against Vanderbilt. You know, the worst game WKU's probably played this season on the offense, and he was the only one he had the touchdown. He had over 100 yards. He had over 100 yards, and so he has been the most consistent, but if I had to choose one, I'm still going with Taylor. Western Kentucky, really kind of a tight end you. Because yeah. you got Jack yeah. Doyle in the NFL right now with the Indianapolis Colts. Mitchell Henry. Mitchell Henry, who's I think he's on the Denver Broncos now after being cut by yeah. the Packers. And now Tyler Higby, a he will be on somebody's that, roster next season. Right. He, he should be into the NFL. He, he, he will be. He will get drafted. and He will be on somebody's active roster next he's, season. He's too Definitely. good. He's built for the position. He's big. He's yeah. strong. He can catch the ball. He's got such soft hands. He can catch the ball anywhere that any of the quarterback throws it to him. He's just he's your prototypical tight end in the league today yeah, with with his size and his ability to catch the ball in the way the nfl is, is such a passing league nowadays it, there's no way you don't have you have higby on on an active roster next season or get even getting drafted i definitely think he's one of the first tight ends to come off the board this season in the draft simply because of the even though it may be conference usa and it may be brendan dowdy or whoever but he's definitely doing a great job in making his case well, last for week, last week i was NFL trying to make the, you guys laughed at me last week when i tried to make the case that brandon dowdy would be highly drafted well you too. said second Coming round, out of you second said second round. Second round pick. That's that's late second that's round still, early third too, round i still think that's a little too high though i, I, I do i think dowdy He's going to be, I mean, but if we're going back to that, I think mean, age plays a big part because he's been in college for six years. I mean, he'll be 24, I really don't think it does, old. especially. You don't think little, so? I think it's going to help him. I think it'll be a little bit more mature, and I know that teams are looking for the face of a franchise and maybe a, your second Bucks reference of the head, James <laughs> oh Winston, God. and just be able to develop. We got two Bucks references. I but think listen, that's a record. Listen, listen, I, I oh think his God. maturity will help, but. Brandon Downey, this is our, you know, we have to go through his stats every game. It we just, have to. It's, They're so impressive. It's a bore, but we have to do it. We so got to bear with us. 457 yards and six touchdowns. He had five in the first half. It's his third straight week with at least 440 passing yards. He was named Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week, Manning Award Star of the Week. And that's swag, the, Brandon Downey. That's Dowdy. the second time in three weeks <laughs> he's gotten both honors. Hashtag oh, swag, Brandon Oh, by Dowdy. the way, he became the all-time school leader in total yards with 8,890 and career completions with 750. Just give him his retired jersey now. Just give him a statue right in front of Smith Stadium right now. Like, why I, not? I don't know about a statue in front of Smith Stadium, but I'll, I'll take I'll take <laughs> the retired jersey. Why, why can't we get him a statue? I, there's been the statue seems like a, a bit much. If he Jeff. wins a second bowl game, if Brandon Dowdy wins a second bowl game with all the records, why can't he get a statue? Absolutely not, Jeff. What? Oh, I think he's I think not if, getting a if statue. He, he wins the Heisman, maybe. He's not going to he win wins the Heisman. Heisman maybe. He wins the Heisman, maybe. He's not going to win a statues Heisman. Statues are for legends. They Is are he not for, a WKU legend? I mean, he's going to be a great player. He may be the best WKU football player ever, of all time, but not a legend. He is not a is legend. EA if Diddle. The, if you're the is best, a legend. if you're the best WK, listen to what you just said. If you're the best WKU football player ever, you don't get a statue. Like you're not a legend. I mean, that's like how does that even make sense? I mean, that there's a ceiling though. There's a difference between being the greatest football player at the University of Alabama. There's also uh, a. Something what? that comes with being the best football player at Western Kentucky. I don't think he deserves a statue. Well, well, think about it though. If he, if he, we, we, we've named the numerous amount of records he's broken, and that he's going to continue. To, not only is he going to break them, he's going to set them so far ahead that it's going to be almost impossible for anybody to break. Right. So he's going to do that. He, he's going to win his second consecutive bowl game, which will be the only oh, he's two. Going to? He's going already, to. Already yes, that? he's going to. Because I, I said the 10 wins, so he's got to get the 10th win oh. somewhere. So I, I can't back off of it. Now, he's going to win his second consecutive bowl games, the first two bowl wins in FBS for WKU. You do that with all your records, and the simple fact that we're even bringing up Heisman contentions and all these crazy numbers he's got, why can't he get a statue? Why? He's a, and he's a quarterback. He's a quarterback, not to mention people love giving quarterback statues. Uh, how how long down the road do you want this statue, Jeff? I mean, 
Do you want it next year? I, I say it's, it's gonna. I mean, it's gonna I be say, a what? I say if you're, you're gonna want it. You're gonna want to see it next year because we're gonna see the drop off after Dowdy oh, once you, he graduates. If Dowdy so gets your, a statue, fans are gonna want to see it if next Dowdy year. If Dowdy gets a statue, it'll be because of the career he had at Western, and then he goes on to have a better career in the NFL. Well, I think uh, that's how he gets the statue. Well, he'll that, get that his makes, jersey retired. Yeah, yeah, he'll get the jersey sure. definitely. But he'll I think that he has to be. He has to excel away from Western. At the NFL level. I think that's kind of unfair. I mean, but I, I get what you're saying, though. You make a valid point. It's kind of no, unfair. They don't give statues to just anybody, Jeff. Well, when he's the best player Where's to ever statue? come, the best player to ever come through your uh to through your program, you deserve a statue. The best player ever. We're talking about Dowdy being the best player in WKU history. It's an interesting debate. Why don't the audience log on to our Twitter account at WKU Red Zone? Tweet us what you guys think. In the meantime, tweet I said us it here your first. W- Tweet us your WKU <laughs> questions. If you have, we'll answer them on air. This is the WKU Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Wednesday nights at 7 every week. And fall break starting, guys. You guys oh, going man. anywhere? No, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. <laughs> I'm going to be up at the in University Bollinger. of Dayton uh, visiting some friends this weekend. That's kind of that's, that's so much better than well, what Jimmy, I'm you, you pointed Well, Jimmy, you touched on something when we started the program. The defense had its best performance of the By year. Far, man. Against Miami of Ohio. So... I'm going to pose this question to you. Was it the tackling that was better? Were there any individuals that stood out to you? What was the difference? Was it just the lack of Miami of Ohio offense, or was there an actual no, step in no. defense? I think, I think it, I, it may be a bit of a combination, combination with a yeah. lack of off- the offensive power from Miami of Ohio. You, you see the teams that they've gone up against so far. They went up against a very high-powered offense in Indiana, very high-powered offense in La Tech. <coughs> Miami's a bit of a drop-off from that. But what impressed me the most was watching the tackling. I said, oh, it, I said it last <laughs> yeah. week, how they were going for the <laughs> highlight hits. Off your chest. Yeah, it they was. They were going for the <laughs> highlight hits and not wrapping up. This week, I saw Brandon Leston wrap somebody up and oh, bring him down. Oh, my gosh. Did they I take was a picture so of that? happy. <laughs> Did they get I that on camera? I was so happy. <laughs> that was what impressed me the most by this defense, is the fact that they were able to hit, wrap up, and textbook tackle during this game. And it really paid off. If you look at some of the tackle stats, you have TJ McCollum, five solo tackles, that's not that's nothing. Of new. course, he's, yeah, gonna that's, be that's every a, week. he's a staple. He gets for that, that every, every week. week. But Nick Holt had five solo tackles. DeAndre Ferris had four. Gavin Rocker had four. You look across the board. The solo tackle lists are going up. The tallies are going up. The total tackles are going up. They looked like the a better team. They looked like a defense. Yeah. A good defense this past week. Not to mention the three interceptions. Yes. Too. I think what's interesting is you brought up before, you know, WK, and we brought up on the show the the secondary play. You know, at times it's a little shaky, and then this past week we saw three interceptions, and a lot of them by younger guys. And DeAndre Ferris, you brought yep. his name up, Laverick Johnson. We're on talking yeah. about that afterwards. Yeah. So that was great. Exactly. So I think with that being said, that's putting pressure on the guys in front of them. They see these guys coming up, and you're, you're going to want to play harder because some guy like a you know a Dre Ferris who's a redshirt freshman coming in making plays. You know, coaches see that. And, and when you're missing a bunch of tackles, you're not playing well as a secondary, as a unit, and other guys are coming in and making plays, that's going to make you work a little bit harder. So when you see these guys come in and make plays right away, you're going to work harder, you're going to play better as a unit, better as a defense. And it also betters the people up front, too. If you know that you have a solid secondary behind you, or a secondary that can make a stop, or knock down a or ball, or a get play. an interception, yeah, make, make a, a play, play it, gives, it instills confidence in the line, and the exactly. linebackers. They feel that they can go further out trying to get to the quarterback, add more pressure instead of having to drop back and really play a secondary position. They can go ahead and apply more pressure, which overall makes the team better. So having that better secondary makes everybody better. Exactly. And you saw it this week. I think there were six three and outs that the defense forced. I and think so. Yep. They really did a good job in the first half, allowing the WKU offense to jump out to such a big lead. They scored 49 points in the first half. So after that, I mean, they were able to just coast. So the defense did their job early and allowed the team to just be able to benefit and get some other players in. But I would not put Miami of Ohio in the same class as Indiana or mm-hmm. even Louisiana Tech. No, and not, not even close. No, no. no. So I don't, I'm not looking at this game and saying that that's going to be wow, the catapult. The way yeah. to go defense. Yeah, that's gonna Nick catapult. Holt's really bringing yeah. it around right now. No, I'm not looking at it like that. I'm saying that you needed to take care of business. Yeah. 
and you sh- you gave up 14 points too many. I mean, that's unrealistic. I, know, I get what but, you're saying, though. Yeah. It, it's understandable. It's understandable. One thing I, I do like that, yeah, that Coach Brom does that I think he got, and got this mantra from Bobby Petrino is receiving the ball. You know, a lot of times in college football you see a team – kick you first so you can get the ball in the second half. When you receive and you score first and you put your team up, by, I mean, that, I think that gives a little bit more confidence to a defense, especially a defense that's struggling. And you know you're playing with the lead instead of playing from behind. That always helps as well. So things, little things like that, you know, schematically always help a football team. Guys, George Fant got his first catch. Oh, man. Oh, the man. The crowd George. roared. Of course oh, George got his first catch. He came in with uh, seven yard, seven yard yep. completion yep. in the fourth yards. quarter. Oh, man. George. It man. was good to see. And, it you was. know, Brom talked about it at the press conference afterwards. He's working hard. It's just, you know, it's tough. There's a deep tight end, and Western Kentucky's got a great tight end lineup. A really great. It's hard to take Tyler Higby out the game. I mean, yeah, honestly. Or Tim yeah, it's it's really hard to take one of the better receiving tight ends, and then you got Gorski coming in, who, who's also a pretty good solid, solid, a solid tight end. And these guys are seniors, too. You know, they've play, been playing football on this team for four years, and for George to just, you know, a lot of people, people who thought George was just going to step on the field and get right in, and they were highly little unrealistic. Yeah, it's, that, it's, that it's not. It's not. Even really though I said that, that at the beginning of the <laughs> you did game. say that. I, th- I said he was going to make yeah. an impact. He did a great job on special teams. Let's let's rewind here. He was playing special teams as well, punt coverage, kick coverage, kick coverage. He yeah. is always there. And I think he's done a great job so far. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not mad at what I said earlier <laughs> yeah. in the year that no, he would make an impact. Off the line, he's, been, be. he's been impacting the special teams definitely. And uh, Coach Brom said that they have a few packages in the offensive scheme where George will come out and they have a run play, they have a pass play. They got a couple plays where they would like to get George involved, yeah. and they uh, unleashed one of them today. And uh, man, Smith Stadium just went crazy when they, George caught the ball. It did. When the I, PA announcer came on and said, <laughs> "Catch George Fant." Oh man, place lit up. Yeah, I think the the more the season progresses, the more he gets acclimated to playing football. I mean, you got to think he's only been playing football for a few months. So the more the season the more the season goes along, the more practices and the deeper they get into their schedule. And you know, you always got to count. I mean, I hate to say it, but injuries. You know, anytime someone goes down or gets fatigued in the game or anything like that, when the when the schedule gets a little tougher, I think we'll start to see George more and more throughout the game. Well, guys, we're going to be joined by Mr. Chad Bishop at 7:20. Talk some more WKU football as WKU tra- goes on the road to take on Rice in Houston, Texas this weekend. But guys, I want to get you uh, your gauge on one final thing before we go to break and before Chad comes on. Is yeah. what do you think of the home crowd? Western wins their Man. second home game this year. It's the uh, home win streak of six games, an FBS era long for them, and it was over 20,000 people that showed up, the most in the Brom era, yep. and the most since yep. the home opener since Morgan State in 2013. So the crowd really came to play. They definitely showed up. I mean, you saw it, I mean, you saw it in a big way. Look, it, it, whether I don't know what you guys saw from the press box, but just being out there in the crowd, I mean, it was packed. It really was packed. They, they brought in a new element, the red wave, the little thing. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, different element, different things. and You're starting to see that that the fans are starting to appreciate what Jeff Brom is doing here and players like Brandon Dowdy, what they're doing on this hill, I mean, on the campus to make things exciting, make this football team relevant again. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what I saw from the press box, Jeff. We got up there, and I looked out the window, looked around, and I said, wow, it's about 10 minutes to kick off. This place is empty. What's going on? <laughs> and about 10 minutes after kick out, I looked out again, and I was like, whoa, this place is packed. <laughs> Whoo! It was a beautiful They had to go sight. get their cold ones, Jimmy. Come it was on, a man. beautiful And, really, and they really saw probably the worst game, just competitive-wise, that we may see Stop. at Smith Stadium. Stop. I don't, was I a don't beautiful see how game. you think that's entertaining. It was a beautiful game. 49-0. to zero We get, what, point? five touchdowns from Dowdy in the first half? How is that not beautiful? First I mean, half, the first half was kind of exciting. But was it was beautiful. Dra- it would just kept dragging on and on. When you, got to the fir- when you got to the end of the first half, it was like, we're, we're up by so many points. Why don't we just call the game now? Well, well, the the game, third quarter was not competitive. Well, I mean, the, was, the games that the fans saw last year when it'd be, you know, 41 to 38, but Western would lose, I, I'm pretty sure they appreciate the 52 to 14 blowouts rather they like, than a 48. They like, the fact 41 they, they like the fact that they won, but I'm sure if you go back and ask them about the closeness of the games, they would say that they would love the games from last year because they were so close. They kept them on the edge of the seat. Yeah, the them on the edge, and then broke their hearts when they lost. <laughs> they kept on the edge of the season, but then the hearts got broken. The hearts were still then. It no, was it, it's exciting. More, it's more nerve wracking as a fan when your team is battling. It's like, oh, you keep giving up points, and then you get your heart gets broken when you lose the game. That's terrible. But I'd much when, rather see the pitch when you win the game. When you win the game, it didn't happen. It was too a often close though. game, and they Most won. Most of the games that were won was because you Marshall got, game. got guys, some guys. Listen, blowout. The people that don't know what we're talking about, Jeff, or we we had an off my chest. It was my off my chest. 
saying that I like lower scoring. You games. like I like stupid defensive games, defensive zero games, juggernaut stuff like that. Yeah, I like the football. Vandy. It was right before the Vandy Sloppy game. Sloppy football, and that was disgusting. And it was entertaining to me. No. And Jeff was the complete opposite, saying that he I likes love Jeff points. Went off. Points. Jeff I love points. points. More points, the, the better. more fun. It's the better. The more, the more, the better. And especially if your team is blowing the other team out, that's perfect. It's way better than having the. I mean, it's it's good to have a close competitive game if your team's not involved. I mean, if your team's not involved, close to a, a nail biter, or, you know, one that keeps you on the edge of the seat, that's cool. Do but you if you really, but if your team's watch... involved and you lose the one, those nail biters, it sucks as a but fan. But do it's you terrible. really want to go watch four quarters of football where you're always up by fifty points? I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind at all. I wouldn't mind at all. Because we're winning. Because we're winning. Right. You Your team is you winning. Would, you wouldn't mind. As long as my team is winning. you would appreciate it, but it's not entertaining. There's a difference between Honestly, entertainment like and your appreciation. I think touchdowns are definitely entertaining. Though, but seeing if, even if you're up 50-3 to three and your team breaks a 60-yard run, that's entertaining to me. I think it, it is. Breaks a 60-yard run, that's entertaining to you, yes. But it's more entertaining when they get... It's more entertaining when you're only up by three. When you extend that to ten because of the 60-yard run, that adds another dimension of excitement. I mean, that's fun, but I think, though, I mean, when my team is up, you know, 60 to nothing and we score a 60-yard run, no matter if we're up three by three, I think it's more entertaining because as long as we're winning and if we win 60 to nothing, hey, we got the win instead of losing 41 to 38. Guys, it'll be interesting to watch for the rest of the year, no doubt. But we're going to take our first break of the program. When we come back, Chad Bishop from WBKO is on the line. We're going to talk some WKU football here on Revolution 91.7. Guys, they go into Rice next week. It's going to be a huge game. It is. First game on the road in Conference USA. What do you guys expect off the top? Well, honestly, Rice has just got pumped by Baylor last week, so I, I'm not for sure how great you know Rice is going, how, how great their morale is going to be after the after the loss to Baylor. You mean getting beat 70 to 17? I mean, it's pretty bad. It, Baylor has an explosive offense, and I think you know with WKU and Brandon Dowdy coming in, I think the the explosiveness the explosiveness of their offense will be able to take advantage of the us uh, Rice secondary. I mean, but you also have to think that overall this season Rice has played a couple of very good games. They ended up beating their they ended up winning their first game 56 to 16. Yeah. Winning their third game 38 to 24 and Baylor is the number 5 team in the nation. That, that is very you ex- true. You expect the number 5 team in the nation to the, come in yeah, and no doubt. whoop you. A, a conference USA team. No doubt. I mean, I'm not saying WKU is Baylor, but I think the most I, I read an interview today, and Rice's most inexperienced uh, position on the field is defensive back. And we saw how Dowdy was able to take take, take advantage, of, advantage of the Indiana lack of second, you know, youth in the secondary. So I think the, with the Rice having youth in, youth in the secondary, that Dowdy will be able to take advantage of that as well. Rice yeah. two and two on the season. Their season opener went against Wagner, fifty six to sixteen. They then lost at the University of Texas, forty two to twenty eight. Winning against a Conference USA opponent, North Texas, 38 to 24. So they lead the top of the CUSA West standings right now, and then they lose to Baylor 70 to 17. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's what we see. I don't know if that's just the town of Baylor, or if that's just it, Rise not. It's, it's, I think that's it's mainly yeah, it's mainly the town of Baylor, no doubt. But I think one thing the WKU will to to make sure they can come out of Rice with a victory is to stop the run. Rice is leading the conference right now in rushing yards per game with 228 per game. And they, I mean, so that's something that Western has struggled with at times. Yeah, especially the against run. Indiana. Exactly. Jordan Howard ran all and over And LaTeX as well. LaTeX running back had, what, over, what, well, close to 180 rushing yards. So stopping the run will be key for WKU getting a victory in Houston. And also, it's not just the running backs that can run the ball. It's the quarterback for yes. Rice, Dreyfus Jackson. He can run the ball, too. He's got 45 carries, only 71 yards, but he's a dual threat, the fact a that passer he's able- and a Runner. To give you that, to give you that, to give them that secondary option at quarterback, being able to run the ball, that's something that Western's going to have to keep. Whether it's a spy or some sort of zone that's scheme that really, or blitz, that's something that really just gets to me, and I don't feel too confident about this because this is a shaky secondary it is. with a rollout quarterback who has the ability to scramble. I just. I'm not liking the chances because I feel like he'll be able to get the secondary to commit more. And when he does that, he's got 750 passing yards yeah. on the season. He can throw the ball. We all know that. But I just don't like this whole aspect between the secondary for WKU and this dual threat quarterback. It's we, going to be we, interesting. I mean, it might be another version. I mean, it might be a, like a 
a replica of the Indiana game. Just hopefully we yep. uh, WKU doesn't make those you know those two late turnovers that kind of almost cost them the game. You right. know, so we, we don't know how good. I mean, it'll be a challenge for the defense coming off that great game against Miami of Ohio. This Rice game will definitely be could be a statement game if the defense is able to play well and hold Rice to under their average in rushing yards and keep the game. Because the thing about running the ball. It's you keep Brandon Dowdy on the sideline. You know, you you have yep. you have you, time of possession. You control, you control the, the clock. Yeah, yep. you, control you control the clock the and you keep that explosive offense of WK on the sideline. And if you can't, if Brandon Dowdy's not on the field, he can't score any points. For and you. that's and that's what people have shown so far throughout the season that if you can keep Brandon Dowdy on the sideline, you keep Western out of the game. Exactly. When you force that defense to be on the field, you tire them out, exactly. and then you can explode in the third quarter like Indiana. Did. And it, and it, it hurts all together. And, it, and that that doesn't. Sp- Spell a good recipe for WKU and getting a victory. Well, look, every game matters, but these conference games, especially on the road, even matter more. Western yeah. did pretty awful on the road last year in yeah. Conference USA. I believe they were one and three, so they really need to rebound from that. And winning these conference games is going to set them up in the East. They're already one and zero, so if they can jump out to two and zero with their first meeting against Rice in program history, another team that they're meeting for the first time ever. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see in Houston, Texas. Kickoff is for two thirty p.m on October 3rd and guys you talked about keeping Brandon Dowdy off the field another offensive weapon that they have that doesn't involve Dowdy is DeAndre Furby yeah yes. I think Furby has really solidified himself as the back for Western Kentucky University even if Ace Wales comes back from so injury, you think so you think even if Ace is 100% percent even Furby's if the Ace guy. is 100% I think it's Furby I think they have to roll with this train and he's just keep rolling over people I think he had 125 yards or 120 yards last week. He's yeah. averaging 5.2 yards a carry. I mean, what more can you ask? He's making the, the most out of his carries. He's making the most out of the opportunity that he's having. And there were questions yeah. when Leon went down. It's questions said, by me. How <laughs> much? <there. laughs> how much of the running game is gone now without Leon Allen, without Ace Wales? You're getting Ace back. He yeah. dressed last week. He didn't play, but he dressed last and week. He's probably he not going to be 100 percent this Saturday. He's probably not going to be 100 percent. But Furby. Last week was a coming out party for Furby. It was it was a great. It game. was a wonderful game. He just ran right over people. A bowling ball is how I tried to compare him in during the game. He yeah. was just one. He just kept running over people, and he's so fast too. He's fast where you don't expect it. So Fur- Furby is. Def- I definitely think Furby is one. Of, is a great back. I don't know if Ace is, if he's 100% if you still go with Furby so far. I think Furby proved a lot last week, but that was against inferior talent. I don't think Miami of Ohio has great a talent as some of the some of the teams that WKU is going to see in Conference USA play. It's a good point. I, yeah, so I think I think he had a great game against them, don't get me wrong, but I think Ace Wilts also he brings experience and he brings a different dimension of speed that just Furby just can't match. Well, he, he did, did have two touchdowns against Indiana, so he, Yeah, he did. He did they, a good they were job short there. yardage plays. They were short yardage right. touchdowns, but I think, you know, Furby lacks the breakaway speed that Ace will give this offense. The the dynamic speed that Leon had and that Ace even has even more than Leon and that Furby just can't match. So I you mean, think you think Ace is going to be the number one when he gets healthy? I think he has to be a hundred percent. Now this Saturday he dressed last Saturday. He did. He, he was play. on the sideline. Yeah, and then this Saturday I think he'll get some carries, but he's I don't think he's a hundred percent by week by his third second or third week back. I think he'll be the number one guy. I think he'll be the guy ahead of Furby. Another past WK running back that had a pretty good week was Antonio Andrews. Um, Pro yeah. toppers. Pro toppers for you there. He had a rushing touchdown in the Titans game against the Colts. I believe it was 50 yards, maybe around yeah, there. Yep. And you know what, guys? I picked him up in fantasy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you I'm did. In a, really? I'm in a very yeah, deep did. league. Okay, 12 teams. <laughs> and I picked him up because, look, it's the Titans bye week. They're sleeping on him right now. And Titans players usually aren't good for fantasy at all. But he looks like the best back. Every time he got the ball, he was extending the play. He was pushing guys towards the first down. And he seemed better than Bishop Sankin, Sankey, the other running back for the Titans. McCluster. De- McCluster. I just feel like he could be this the was, back this in was Tennessee. His first, this was his first game playing for Tennessee, correct? Yes, he was injured. Yes. So this was his first game this first season. Game it was his coming season. out party. And he was playing <laughs> against what is now a floundering Indiana Colts. Right, the Colts aren't very good. Oh, my no. gosh, Colts. So... Get I mean, help I think Indiana. I think that could be just kind of a fluke. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I think he, he looked good in the game, but he's playing against a bad defense. We were talking about how we think Miami was less the less good defense, stellar. just a bad offense. Well, I think that it was less Antonio Andrews being and an amazing back the and more bad. The no, Colts Jimmy, he's defense. amazing, and I just had a great fantasy football pickup. Uh, I wouldn't go as far well, as to say look, it's a great. Pickup. Look, a little read option nice. with Marcus Mariota. 
You're not feeling that, Jeff? I mean, I like Antonio Andrews, honestly. I mean, coming into the season, I, I thought he would make an impact on on that uh, t- Tennessee Titans team. Now, whether I would have picked him up in fantasy off a team that it goes three backs yeah. deep. Mm. I mean, a team that goes three backs deep in Tennessee is not going to be good this year. I mean, let's just let's just be honest. They're, they're going to win be about six games. <laughs> For your third Buccaneers reference of the game, another oh pro God. topper pro in the league is Bobby Rainey. Yeah, he is. Now, Bobby is the third back. In Tampa, so not really doing too much there, but doing a great job on special teams. and kick returns. Special teams, yeah. Does a great job. Does special teams. And really, the goal I see in that is if you can get back to the 20 on a kick return, then you're doing you know better than expected. Yeah. So I, I, he is always inconsistently getting past that 20 yard line, and another WK player just showing his worth in the NFL. Yeah, Bobby Rainey is someone that he he had his breakout year a few seasons ago when Doug Martin was hurt and he's i mean you want to talk about a WKU legend i mean he's definitely one of the first w, i mean one of the more recent WKU legends that Should i can he remember get a statue? no he shouldn't he's not he's not a quarterback he was a leader when they changed to FBS yes he, he and he's also not a quarterback he hasn't set as many records as Brendan. i mean i could go on and on why dad to get the statue but speaking back to Bobby Rainey i mean i think he he's uh, he's showing his worth in the NFL he got a nice contract over a million, a million and a half dollars this past off season so he's definitely He's definitely showing why he deserves to be in the NFL. Some pro toppers in the league. We'll have to keep our eye on them throughout the season. We're going to take our second break of the program. When we come back, we're going to talk a little WKU baseball and, guys, some more football, of course. And oh. also, Hilltopper Hysteria. Oh, yeah, it is. Announced. Yep. We're going to talk you more well, into you that. Hoops fans. Here, we got 30 minutes left here on the Red Zone here on Revolution at 91.7. Talking all things Tapper Sports, you're listening to Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Welcome back to the WKU Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. We are WKU Sports Talk Show every Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Your host today, Billy Rutledge, Jimmy Stratman, and Jeff Lightsey. Guys, we just had a good 35 minutes. We had some technical difficulties with yeah, Chad we, Bishop. Yeah, of course. We had some great questions, too, for yeah. Chad. We were really going to kill that interview. It is a red zone. Back. It is a red zone if we don't have technical difficulties yeah. in studio. It really, the one, the one yeah. day we have all the mics working in studio, yeah. we don't get the phone. We don't get, I mean, if it isn't the mics, it's the phones. If the, is if, if it isn't the phones, it's the mics. It's like, man, what it, I mean, what's well, going on? Guys, switching sports from the hill to the first most popular sport on the hill to the second, the WKU basketball men's and women's Hilltopper oh, Hysteria was Definitely. announced. Definitely going to be interesting. The two-hour long, what is it, like hype show? Yeah, kind of yeah. I mean, Pretty it, much. It's, it's like Midnight Madness for most other schools. You yeah. know, I know Kentucky, North Carolina, Kansas, they have Midnight Kentucky. Madness. Right, so like it will that. be Saturday, October 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Diddle Arena, yeah. and it's going to include uh, individual player and coaches' introductions, so yeah. the lights dim and everybody's yeah. like, now coming out from whatever state, right, from yeah. whatever high school. So you got that. Scrimmages by both teams, the men's yeah. and women's, to get a little preview of what to come. A slam dunk contest. That's the, the best men's. part. That's probably that the best was, part. Yeah, was it uh, Spreewell that won Spreewell it last year? Spreewell, who's no longer with us. Well, yeah. Him and quite a few players are no longer yeah. with us. But he, Spreewell, he was, Spreewell won he was it, part, but he won. Trincy had the dunk. Oh man! Really, everybody oh, remembered yeah. the really botched dunk that went straight up and right back oh, in. Oh my! Yeah, that yeah. was the best part. So, <laughs> including that, those things, there's a shooting stars challenge with current and former players. So, well, ooh, that sounds interesting. Who do you think is going to come back there? Maybe Chastity Gooch and George Fant. Oh, Mr. Boy. and Mrs. Hilltopper. <laughs> hey man, Chastity, George Fant, just get them off the field, get them back on the court one more I time. See Courtney Lee come back for that. Wow, that would be something. That would be I, awesome I doubt to that see Courtney though. Lee. Really, Courtney Lee, maybe Jeremy Evans, somebody. Yeah, yeah somebody. And then to end the night, more to pro toppers. End the night an autograph session for the kids and the fans. That's so always, it's always yeah. a good time, and I was it was my first time last year going, and I had a really good time. The slam dunk contest, yeah. easily the best part of the yeah. night, and I think it's a good chance to highlight some of the new players, which is going to be very important this year. Yeah, I mean, I think going out to Hilltop Rosteria for anyone who is a WKU basketball fan is almost you have to do it because with mm-hmm. such great ro- roster turnover and we're talking about nine new players nine new players are, i mean nine players that have left and now there's new ones coming into the season i mean you got to get familiar with them and even for us in the media it's hard to get familiar with some of these yeah. guys because they're brand new they're brand all, new to the program all three of us should, are probably going to be there just so yeah, we can definitely. see what they can do it's it, even what the they look like who they are i mean <laughs> i mean the scrimmage scrimmage isn't nothing that isn't anything that they really try in mm, no. but it'd still be good to see what the new players can bring what they're what they're going to be like shooting the ball, how they're going to be able to move the ball Definitely a little bit, the chem, a little bit of the chemistry, and also I, I would like to see the you know some of the guys who are coming back like Chris Harrison, Docs, Justin Johnson, 
what type of leadership what type of leadership roles do they take this season i mean what how how are, has their game developed what type of leadership roles do they take and also you know can they get this group of guys this brand new group of guys to come together and play well and have a good season in conference USA basketball is so important in chemistry it definitely yep. only five players on the court at a time it's much different than football where you can have chemistry, it's very important yeah. as well, but you're also doing your own job. And it just seems like basketball, you have to be able to flow, know the guys' tendencies. Exactly. Yep. And I just don't know how they're going to have that yeah. with only five returning players from That's the year before. Yeah, with, yeah with, with the, it's going to be between the coaching staff and also with those veteran I mean, those veteran leaders. I mean, whether these guys are able to get their guys to come in and click. I mean, you got some you got some senior leadership in guys like Aaron Cosby, who's transfer, who's played big-time Division One basketball at Illinois, mm-hmm. and at Seton Hall, he's coming in, so. I think he's going to make an immediate impact. And some, and some JUCO guys, you know, some guys that's coming in, but a lot of a lot of freshmen as well. Yep. So we'll see how that goes. And then you look on the coaching staff; they had to bring in a new position, a brand new position this year. Play uh, administrator of player development, I yeah. think is who they're Benzer, what they're calling it. Ben, ben Hansborough, Hansborough yeah. coming in to Western to try it's to a great help. addition, by the way. It's, it is a good addition, pickup. and it really, I think, they're, the reason they're doing that is because of all the turnovers. Yeah, really, they're trying to make. Look for a way to get all these guys to gel and one person to really step in and do it. And Ben Hansborough seems like, from his past history playing basketball, that he would be the guy to do it. He's got good credentials. I mean, playing at Notre, yeah. playing Notre Dame and living in Louisville, I got to see Ben Hansborough up close and personal for a few years, and he 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 could really play the play basketball. He was a really good player, and I think I think he'll be able to come in help, especially those young guards, help them develop. You know, try to get some good chemistry. Hopefully, he gets he can pull the the best out of Chris Harrison Docks, help him play at a at a new level at an even higher level than he was a year ago a lot of turnover on the basketball team this year there's also some turnover on the wqu baseball team first year head yep. coach and hired this year john Pulowski. he comes over with 14 years experience as a coach his record of 505 to 318 previously coaching at san diego state auburn college of charleston arizona state and clemson comes in with 11 years of experience in the NCAA tournament. So this is going to be a big year for WKU baseball. And to me, and finally try to get over the hump of mediocre. Mediocrity, really, yeah. yeah, seriously. Like their last two seasons, 24 and 28, 29 and 28 with Coach Myers. And Coach Myers did some good things there. They Last year they swept all their team uh, in-state opponents, went 4-0 and against yep. beating UK, UK twice, Louisville. Murray Louisville. State, and then number three Louisville at Louisville. So they did some big. good things, but they were n- never able to con- uh, have that consistent winning. And maybe somebody, somebody like Pulowski with a, a history of winning can bring that here. They really, Matt Myers was the model of inconsistency in his time at the Hill. They did good things. They did bad things. They could never string together great things. And they've really gone out and really Todd Stewart pulled out the stops, all the stops, looking for a guy who knows winning, knows consistent winning. Right. And I think that... Pulowski is the guy to bring it to the hill. And then also, he coached at Auburn, too. Yeah, I got, I, I got to like that. <laughs> of course. I think Pulowski, it, it's just a fresh face. You guys touched on how, you know, a model of inconsistency, the baseball team, they would have really good wins over top-ranked U of L and good teams like UK. And bringing in a fresh face and something new can also spark a team. And, and maybe he's able to implement some things that, you know, Coach Myers wasn't able to do and able to pull out the max potential out of these guys and that, that they haven't, they've been underachieving when it's time to play against some of the conference opponents. Yeah, and some it, of the it, seems like, it seems like they've been playing to their competition's exactly. level. When they play the good teams, the UKs, the UofLs, they play great and they end up winning. When they play some of the bad teams, some of the conference teams, they play down to their competition and that ultimately kills them during those games. Well, the WT department really paying to get Pulowski. Coach yeah. Myers' Pretty salary was 160000 a year. Pulowski is $195,000, uh, $35,000 more. Guess how much he got paid while he was the head coach at Auburn? How much? <laughs> Just try. Just give me a number. Uh, is it over or under 190 It's over. Way I'm over. I'm going to go... Oh man, I was gonna say something. You said way over. What? Is it 300k? 340. Oh my god! Well, the head coach at Auburn. Man, he's taking a little salary decrease, but coming to Western, where they're going to be paying a lot. Western also has to pay uh, Coach Myers' buyout because his contract wasn't up, and he was terminated with no cause. How much do you think that was? 
uh, 200K. 125. 125, okay. Mm-hmm. So Western really putting some money hey, into the baseball. They program. are. I mean, if you want results, sometimes you got to pay to get results. And hopefully you're paying, you're paying Coach Pulaski yep. this, this increase from what you gave Myers to get better results. I you got to spend so he's money gotta to come, make money. Exactly. And so to hopefully to get a winning program going, to get some more consistent winning going over in the baseball program, you're going to pay for it. And that's just another move that I've liked that Todd Stewart has implemented in his time at Western. By, uh, bringing in Pulaski for Myers, that just seems like it, it's a good fit for the baseball team, a team that's been floundering, somebody that hasn't, a team that hasn't really been succeeding. Yeah. They bring in, they spend the money, bring in the new guy, and hopefully With a lot of experience. It'll, over a couple of years, you can't imagine that it's going to be just overnight. immediate, it's overnight not, it's never, impact. It's never overnight But you impact. give him a couple of years so that he can build the program the way he wants to build it, and I think you see the Western baseball team really start to take off over the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, you, when you bring in a guy with that much experience, you know, that especially at a high level at Auburn, you know, at other Division One colleges, you're going to have to pay for it. And hopefully, like you said, he can come in and make, and make an impact. Maybe not as immediate as next season or as this season coming up, but in the years of the future, hopefully this will be worth it. And he he's also had a history of uh, players getting drafted and going to play in the uh, major leagues. Most notably, one of his players who graduated in 2005, Brett Gardner, the playing Yankees. for the Yankees oh, man. right now. Yankee mm-hmm. center fielder, Brett Gardner. Yep. He's a pretty good player. Well, hopefully he can bring that success to the Hill. You guys are listening to the WK Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. I want to hit one more headline before we get into our final segment of the night, which is off my chest. We get a little rant time mm, going on. We, we love that. But one more headline before we get to that. The Middle Tennessee game yeah. announced 11 a.m. kickoff by Fox Sports. Man. Fans will be oh able to tailgate God. until dark, just since there's not a lot of time before the 11 a.m. kickoff. <laughs> and a lot of Hilltopper fans are not happy with this. A lot of backlash. Uh, I bet they are. How are the way that you guys see it? Do you like the change or do you not? I mean, that, that uh, I'm 11 a.m. is terrible. I, mean, I sleep till 11 a.m. on the weekends. I mean, that is awful. 11 a.m. kickoffs in football period are just aren't. Aren't pleasant, you know. They're terrible. They're More terrible. for TV. More exactly. for people around the country. To exactly. Watch it. And then think about as a fan, if you're traveling to the game. I mean, if you're traveling and things like it, whether you're traveling there as a, an away fan or whatever, like in the traffic and so. I mean, in eleven and then kickoff is at eleven a.m. That's just and it's just terrible. You mentioned around. you mentioned like the traffic. Exactly. I remember trying to get to the game this past weekend. And I was I had trouble parking in the afternoon. You get to there in the morning. Imagine how long I'm going to have to exactly uh, how early I'm going to have to leave to try to get a parking spot exactly on campus or near campus to get to the game. It exactly. just seems ridiculous. And for people that, that are commuting from Tennessee, I mean, it's just I don't know. It's just it, it's I don't like it. I don't like it. At all. I'm one of those disgruntled fans that just like football should be played in afternoon or like I think it, I think it'd be more better football atmosphere at night you know middle test at night is the best of a course. huge rivalry but you can't get it at with night. a rivalry game a heated rivalry exactly. over the years prime time is always the best but if you can't get it at night three o'clock is that unreasonable two two thirty and two o'clock 11 a.m so do you so do you terrible. think that there's going to be a drop off in fans there if the announced attendance yep. going to go Definitely. way down no um, if there was twenty thousand fans if we're shooting for we we should be shooting for like 17 18 Announced anyway, because I mean, you got to think, you know, college. It, it, it's, we're still a college school. You know, people go out on Friday nights, 11 a.m. At least at the beginning of the game, anyway. Maybe through halftime, if it's a close, still competitive, that you might see people starting to roll in a little later. But at let, at 11 a.m., you're not going to see 20,000. Last week, in part of, last week, part of the 20,000 was the fact that it was parent weekend that here on as the well. hill. That yeah. also that helped. really the parents were that down here. They the wanted to go see that the football the game. Attendance as well. So I think that you're going to see a drop off. Maybe not. Strictly because of, a, of an eleven o'clock start, I think definitely I think it will be because of an eleven o'clock start. But you, you don't have the parents that are saying, "Come on, let's go watch the football game." We're here on campus. More time with their daughter yeah, their we're son. here on campus. Let's go experience Western football. So you don't have that this week. So I would expect a drop off from that too. And, and also, when, we, when you set career highs in attendance, you're not going to continue to break that every week. I mean, you, you set no. the career high in twenty thousand. Unless your name Brandon plus. Dowdy, right? Yeah, and I mean, hey, swag, or, or you play yeah. the song "Swag Brandon Dowdy." I think There's that's no going to get some. There's no ceiling for Brandon. Dowdy. I think that's going to get some fans in the seats if you play that during warmups. If y'all haven't listened to it yet, go to our Twitter <laughs> at WKU to. Red Zone. You play that during warm ups, that's going to get some people Swag in the Brandon seats. Dowdy song. Swag Brandon Dowdy. Yeah, and let so. us know what you think about it. <laughs> yeah, please tweet us. Because we're a little bit divided thoughts. here. I think it's awesome. Very divided. But, guys, we're going to take our final break of the program. When we come back, Off My Chest is coming up. Yeah, it's it time is. for us to rant. You're listening to the WKU Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. Keeping you up to date on Western Kentucky sports, you're in the red zone right here on Revolution 91.7. 
classic red balloons. 99. Classic red 99. balloons. To get us back into the program, you're listening to the WKU Red Zone here on Revolution 917, a WKU sports talk show every Wednesday nights from 7 to 8. Your host tonight, Billy Rutledge, Jimmy Stratman, and Jeff Leitze, our final 10 minutes of the program, and you guys know oh so well. Then we're going to do our Off My Chest segment, a time to let us rant about what we want to get off our chest. Yes. Something that's really divided this room yeah. <laughs> the past few times. We've talked hey, about low-scoring football about games. We've yeah. talked about bad punting jobs by Western <laughs> Kentucky. We've They're talked getting about, better. I mean, hey, we, they benched him. <laughs> they, they, they benched like a penny, man. I think yeah. Jimmy Jimmy called for his head, and they sent up, sat him on the bench. I think that's they what Jeff Brown's listening to the show. Exactly. Of course <laughs> he's he like, is. I can't handle and that's more why Jimmy. He's, and that's why he's going to play swag Brandon Daddy in pregame warm-ups. It's going to happen. I'm just calling That right would now. be funny. It, that would it's going to happen. I'd love to see that. It's going to happen because they're listening right now. They're listening to us, you guys. Well, guys, our final ten minutes of the program, I'm going to do one of the off my chest this week because right. this week I have something a little bit different. It's not so much of a rant but an, an appreciation piece. But what I want to get off my chest is more appreciation for consistency. This is kind of dedicated to the WKU senior kicker, Garrett Schwetman. Garrett, last week he made all eight of his uh, PAT attempts Saturday, and in the process he passed former kicker Chris James for the school career scoring record of 298 points. He now sits at 304 after the game. 5'11", 175-pound Schwetman made 16 of his 21 field goal attempts last season and 70 PAT, setting the WKU single-season scoring record with 118. He was the second-leading scorer among CUSA kickers and ranked 19th nationally. But Schwetman, he came here when there was a lot of inconsistency at WKU for the kicking position. WKU had just made 5 of 20 field goals as a team in 2011. And that 25% rate ranked the tops dead last in the FBS. So, Shoddy, he started his freshman year when he came, and he has had the job ever since. He's converted 66 straight PATs, the second longest street in Hilltopper history, and his 175 PATs are the most ever at this school. So a little how do you do and a clap, golf clap for Garrett Schwetman for breaking the record and what he's been able to bring to this WKU program. Uh, I'm a little hesitant, though. I mean, I'm not trying to sound like... Why a, are you Because hip- think about it. First of all, you said he made 16 of his 21 field goals last season. That's yes. just 76%. I mean, it, it's okay. It, it's all right. And he's setting all these records. you got to remember, he's getting all these extra point attempts because the offense has scored a lot of touchdowns. So that's kind of... It's not like he's out here kicking six field goals a game and just knocking them down. You go from making five and 80. twenty for the team to go into sixteen and twenty-one. So he's making. I mean, I'm not a saying lot more he's, field goals. Yeah, he's making a lot more field goals, but he's getting a lot. I mean, he, he he's breaking he's breaking these records partially because I mean mainly because he's getting a lot of extra point attempts. Therefore, because the offense is scoring a lot more touchdowns than they used to. So. It's great, you know. He's he's getting. I mean, he should get some praise, and I'm glad you gave him some appreciation. But it, I don't think it's as, I just, as great. I, mean, I, I like making a team. I like Schwedman. I like the fact no. that he's been he's been I mean, like the the anchor almost. He's been one of the leaders. He's been here since Taggart, I believe, mm-hmm. from Taggart to Petrino, now to Brom, and he's been consistent throughout all of it. He's been really the guy that you call him. You say that he's only made like 76 percent of his of a, of, of his kicks. And you don't think that he's getting the praise because the offense is doing most of the work for I him. Think so. But still, if you run out, you have to run out the kicker every extra point. Yeah, and he true. has to make it every not, extra point. And not yeah. a kicker that but, starts every four years breaks the WKU or the school program scoring record. And, I mean, and, this guy has been able to do it all four years. But not every. And he's, and he's been able to bring consistently to the position, and that's all that you really needed a kicker. But not, but not every. Not every kicker gets the opportunity to kick that many extra points when your offense is scoring 40 points a game and getting, you know, but four or five still, touchdowns. It's true. That's, okay. a product, that's a product of the system. Exactly. But but he's capitalized off of the system. Right. Uh, you, you guys got to remember, extra points in college football still have the two-yard line. Like they're, they're, I mean, if you can't go out and kick an extra point and make an extra point, you just don't deserve a scholarship. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just, let's just be that serious. It's not like he's making a whole bunch of game-winning field goals, like field goals to win the game. He's getting a lot of extra points. So I'm not like I said I'm not trying to bring any slight to Garrett Schwitman, but Schwitman, he's Schwitman. I'm sorry, but come on, Jim. Um, I mean he, he's he's, he's going to knock him, he's pronounce right. his name. What I right. what I what I, <laughs> what I got right. off my chest right. was more appreciation for consistency, and I think yeah. I did that. I mean yeah, and I and I applaud that, but I'm just saying like you know he's breaking the record, but all right here we go. This is the off my chest segment <laughs> that we all love. Hold we on, all go on. back and forth. Yeah, hold, on, hold on, hold on. I just I just want to say something over the over his career. He's gone from 76% up to 80%, 81%. 
in accuracy. He has never dipped below 76. He's never gotten above 81%. The 76 was last season, too, as well, right? 76 was his, was his first season and last season. In 2013, 82%. This so season so far, on. this season so far, he's gotten 80 percent of his field goals of his. He's gotten 80 uh, percent percentage, and really, I mean, he that's consistent. Jeff, that's consistent <laughs> right there. Right. That I is mean, consistent. It's like it's really not that now that you he went from 80 to 70. It's not as okay. consistent right, as it was. Jeff, what's your off my chest? All right, my off my chest. Okay, we're coming up on. What, what has it been? Two years since the the tennis the tennis program has been disbanded here at WKU. It's around the two men's years. tennis. Yeah, yeah, the men's tennis team has been disbanded for about two years, and the, it comes from lack of funding mainly. Yeah, I thought at first maybe it came from like the Title IX thing because you know you have to have an equal amount of sports as women for men as well. Right. But I think it, it came from lack of funding, is what Todd Stewart said at the time. And I went back and read some stuff. Mainly, what I wanted is why doesn't you know, for pro toppers, we brought them up in Antonio Andrews, we brought up Bobby Rainey, we got some other pro toppers. We currently have six NFL pro toppers. Why isn't that some some of the pro toppers give back to this athletic program that we have here at WKU? No, an athletic program that is that is striving, that's hitting their stride, especially when it comes to football right now. It's doing a really great job. I mean, I talked about earlier how Bobby Rainey's contract this past season was for a million and five dollars. Like, I mean, a million, uh, one point five million. His 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 current contract that he just signed this summer. So why can't you give back a little bit to your former your alma mater? You got six current NFL players, and I'm not saying now. I saw Patrick Peterson this past summer this uh, season. He gave a million dollars back to LSU program. I'm not calling for that from Bobby Rainey or any pro topper, but anything would help, and that would also be able to fund some of the some of the athletic programs that we have that have that we have here on campus. And you have six current NFL players, three players. In the uh, on practice squads, and the average salary for a practice squad players around 100k. You know, the average salary for an NFL player is around 500,000 per season. And then you've had 30 former players go from WKU to play in the NFL. So I think they should be able to give back some and able to be able to help when it comes to funding the athletic. How much did you here. say that Antonio Andrews was making this year? I'm not for sure. I said Bobby Rainey signed for Bobby 1. Rainey. 5. Yeah. All right, 1.5 1. 1. 5 million. 1. 5. I'm Patrick not for Peterson sure. Patrick is making 16.25 million dollars. We're not gonna get a guy to donate a million dollars, but something. If you have 30 former toppers playing the NFL, you could get something from somebody. I don't think they're they're not giving back though. I'm sure there's a lot of alumni that give back to the programs. It's just not maybe the guy that's currently trying to make the team right now. It may not be Antonio Andrews or Bobby Rainey, but I'm sure I'm somebody has had to have given back. I'm definitely, After, definitely I'm in sure, the past. Uh, Courtney Lee's probably given some money to the program. To the He's, basketball, but, right. but we're not for sure though. Like it, I think though, I'm if, not sure. No. Well, yeah, but I'm saying I think if Courtney Lee or Jeremy Evans or any other pro topper or uh, current or past. If they would give a check that they would have, I mean, I think it would have been announced. I mean, I'm pretty sure it would have been announced. As much as WKU love announcing that pl- when players do great things for this for this university, I'm pretty sure if Courtney Lee gives a check that they're going to announce it somewhere yeah. sometime. Yeah, but when you look at the pro NFL toppers, you have Bobby Rainey, who's the third running back for the Bucks right now. Yes. You got Antonio Andrews, who was hurt, and he's finally starting to play a little yeah. bit for the Titans. Jack Doyle in Indiana still not becoming that big tight end for Andrew Luck yet. So... They're not really. I don't think they're really focused on spending their money giving back to their old program. They're more focused on the here and now, making sure that they can make more money yeah. to give back. I mean, maybe. it's under, it's understandable, but you have a guy like Courtney Lee that I didn't even think of, who's who's an established NBA player. I mean, he's five plus seasons in the NBA. Can't you throw a little change our way? Throw a little change WKU's way, man. That's all I'm asking. Well, we'll have to keep our eye and see if they do end up giving back or when it is announced or not. But I'm sure there's some money here and there. But I mean, yeah, of course, but more can be done. You so we won't have teams disbanded and things like that. that that's all I wanted to but get are off they, my are chest. They, are they giving? Are the players giving back to just their specific program or the athletic fund in just general? any? Just anything. Like if it, if if. You're giving back to the basketball team, they're going to announce it. You're giving back to the athletics, they're going to announce it. Todd Stewart, somebody's going to announce it, so that's But all. it probably won't do If I mean, pro NFL toppers, pro NBA toppers, probably giving back will not so bring program. back the tennis. No, program. I understand that, though. I understand, but just giving back, period. I like off my chest. I think we're going to keep that segment. I think, I think it's usually, good. Yeah, I think it yeah. gives a good job of us letting a rant, even though Jeff doesn't 
uh, appreciate the kicker of Western <laughs> Kentucky. Guys, pretty just, good show. Yeah. A little disappointed Chad couldn't get on Man. talk WK Sports. We're going to try yeah. to get him on next week. Yeah, I hope he comes back. Hopefully we can get Chad. WK Red, Red Zone, stuff. every Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on Revolution 91.7. Guys, good show for Jimmy Stratman, Jeff Lightsey, and Billy Rutledge. Everyone have a good night. Billy Rutledge, 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 everyone have a good night.